an impossible enchantment. There once lived a king who was much loved by his people, and he, too, loved them warmly. He led a very happy life, but he had the greatest dislike to the idea of marrying, nor had he ever felt the slightest wish to fall in love. His subjects begged him to marry, and at last he promised to try to do so. But, as so far, he had never cared for any woman he had seen, he made up his mind to travel in hopes of meeting some lady he could love. So he arranged all the affairs of state in an orderly manner, and set out, attended by only one equerry, who, though not very clever, had most excellent good sense. These people, indeed, generally make the best fellow-travelers. The king explored several countries, doing all he could to fall in love, but in vain, and at the end of two years' journeys he turned his face towards home, with as free a heart as when he set out. As he was riding along through a forest, he suddenly heard the most awful meowing and shrieking of cats you can imagine. The noise drew nearer and nearer, and at last they saw a hundred huge Spanish cats rush through the trees close to them. They were so closely packed together that you could easily have covered them with a large cloak, and all were following the same track. They were closely pursued by two enormous apes, dressed in purple suits, with the prettiest and best-made boots you ever saw. The apes were mounted on superb mastiffs, and spurred them on in hot haste, blowing shrill blasts on little toy trumpets all the time. The king and his equerry stood still to watch this strange hunt, which was followed by twenty or more little dwarves, some mounted on wolves and leading relays, and others with cats in leash. The dwarfs were all dressed in purple silk liveries, like the apes. A moment later, a beautiful young woman, mounted on a tiger, came in sight. She passed close to the king, riding at full speed, without taking any notice of him. But he was at once enchanted by her, and his heart was gone in a moment. To his great joy, he saw that one of the dwarfs had fallen behind the rest, and at once began to question him. The dwarf told him that the lady he had just seen was the princess Mutinosa, the daughter of the king in whose country they were at that moment. He added that the princess was very fond of hunting, and that she was now in pursuit of rabbits. The king then asked the way to the court, and having been told it, hurried off, and reached the capital in a couple of hours. As soon as he arrived, he presented himself to the king and queen, and on mentioning his own name and that of his country, was received with open arms. Not long after, the princess returned, and hearing that the hunt had been very successful, the king complimented her on it, but she would not answer a word. Her silence rather surprised him, but he was still more astonished when he found that she never spoke once all through supper-time. Sometimes she seemed about to speak, but whenever this was the case, her father or mother at once took up the conversation. However, the silence did not cool the king's affection, and when he retired to his rooms at night, he confided his feelings to his faithful equerry. But the equerry was by no means delighted at his king's love affair, and took no pains to hide his disappointment. "'But why are you vexed?' asked the king. Surely the princess is beautiful enough to please any one? She is certainly very handsome, replied the equerry, but to be really happy in love something more than beauty is required. To tell the truth, sire, he added, her expression seems to me hard. That is pride and dignity, said the king, and nothing can be more becoming. Pride or hardness, as you will, said the equerry, but to my mind the choice of so many fierce creatures for her amusements seems to tell of a fierce nature, and I also think there is something suspicious in the care taken to prevent her speaking. The equerry's remarks were full of good sense, but as opposition 
is only apt to increase love in the hearts of men, and especially of kings who hate being contradicted. This king begged, the very next day, for the hand of the princess Mutinosa. It was granted him on two conditions. The first was that the wedding should take place the very next day, and the second that he should not speak to the princess till she was his wife, to all of which the king agreed, in spite of his equerry's objections, so that the first word he heard his bride utter was the yes she spoke at their marriage. Once married, however, she no longer placed any check on herself, and her ladies-in-waiting came in for plenty of rude speeches. Even the king did not escape scolding, but as he was a good-tempered man and very much in love, he bore it patiently. A few days after the wedding, the newly married pair set out for their kingdom without leaving many regrets behind. The good equerry's fears proved only too true, as the king found out to his cost. The young queen made herself most disagreeable to all her court. Her spite and bad temper knew no bounds, and before the end of a month she was known far and wide as a regular vixen. One day, when riding out, she met a poor old woman walking along the road who made a curtsy and was going on when the queen had her stopped and cried, you are a very impertinent person don't you know that i am the queen and how dare you not make me a deeper curtsy madam said the old woman i have never learnt how to measure curtsies but i had no wish to fail in proper respect what screamed the queen she dares to answer Tie her to my horse's tail, and I'll just carry her at once to the best dancing master in the town to learn how to curtsy. The old woman shrieked for mercy, but the queen would not listen, and only mocked when she said she was protected by the fairies. At last the poor old thing submitted to be tied up, but when the queen urged her horse on, he never stirred. In vain she spurred him. He seemed turned to bronze. At the same moment, the cord with which the old woman was tied changed into wreaths of flowers, and she herself into a tall and stately lady. Looking disdainfully at the queen, she said, Bad woman, unworthy of your crown, I wished to judge for myself whether all I had heard of you was true. I have now no doubt of it, and you shall see whether the fairies are to be laughed at. So saying, the fairy Placida, that was her name, blew a little gold whistle, and a chariot appeared drawn by six splendid ostriches. In it was seated the fairy queen, escorted by a dozen other fairies mounted on dragons. All having dismounted, Placida told her adventures, and the fairy queen approved all she had done, and proposed turning Mutinosa into bronze like her horse. Placida, however, who was very kind and gentle, begged for a milder sentence, and at last it was settled that Mutinosa should become her slave for life unless she should have a child to take her place. The king was told of his wife's fate and submitted to it, which, as he could do nothing to help it, was the only course open to him. The fairies then all dispersed, Placida taking her slave with her, and, on reaching her palace, she said, You ought by rights to be scullion, but as you have been delicately brought up, the change might be too great for you. I shall therefore only order you to sweep my rooms carefully, and to wash and comb my little dog. Maltinosa felt there was no use in disobeying, so she did as she was bid, and said nothing. After some time she gave birth to a most lovely little girl, and when she was well again, the fairy gave her a good lecture on her past life, made her promise to behave better in future, and sent her back to the king, her husband. Placida now gave herself up entirely to the little princess who was left in her charge. She anxiously thought over which of the fairies she would invite to be godmothers, so as to secure the best gift for her adopted child. 
At last she decided on two very kindly and cheerful fairies, and asked them to the christening feast. Directly it was over, the baby was brought to them in a lovely crystal cradle hung with red silk curtains embroidered with gold. The little thing smiled so sweetly at the fairies that they decided to do all they could for her. They began by naming her Graziella, and then Placida said, You know, dear sisters, that the commonest form of spite or punishment amongst us consists of changing beauty to ugliness, cleverness to stupidity, and oftener still to change a person's form altogether. Now, as we can only each bestow one gift, I think the best plan will be for one of you to give her beauty, the other good understanding, whilst I will undertake that she shall never be changed into any other form. The two godmothers quite agreed, and as soon as the little princess had received their gifts, they went home, and Placida gave herself up to the child's education. She succeeded so well with it, and little Graziella grew so lovely that when she was still quite a child her fame was spread abroad only too much and one day placida was surprised by a visit from the fairy queen who was attended by a very grave and severe looking fairy the queen began at once i have been much surprised by your behavior to mutinosa she had insulted our whole race and deserved punishment you might forgive your own wrongs if you choose, but not those of others. You treated her very gently while she was with you, and I come now to avenge our wrongs on her daughter. You have ensured her being lovely and clever and not subject to change of form, but I shall place her in an enchanted prison, which she shall never leave till she finds herself in the arms of a lover whom she herself loves. It will be my care to prevent anything of the kind happening." The enchanted prison was a large high tower in the midst of the sea, built of shells of all shapes and colors. The lower floor was like a great bathroom, where the water was let in, or off at will. The first floor contained the princess's apartments, beautifully furnished. On the second was a library, a large wardrobe room filled with beautiful clothes and every kind of linen, a music room, a pantry with bins full of the best wines, and a storeroom with all manner of preserves, bonbons, pastry, and cakes, all of which remained as fresh as if just out of the oven. The top of the tower was laid out like a garden, with beds of the loveliest flowers, fine fruit trees, and shady arbors and shrubs, where many birds sang amongst the branches. The fairies escorted Graziella and her governess, Bonetta, to the tower, and then mounted a dolphin, which was waiting for them. At a little distance from the tower the queen waved her wand, and summoned two thousand great fierce sharks, whom she ordered to keep close guard, and not to let a soul enter the tower. The good governess, took such pains with Graziella's education that when she was nearly grown up she was not only most accomplished, but a very sweet, good girl. One day, as the princess was standing on a balcony, she saw the most extraordinary figure rise out of the sea. She quickly called Bonetta to ask her what it could be. It looked like some kind of man, with a bluish face and long sea-green hair. He was swimming towards the tower, but the sharks took no notice of him. "'It must be a merman,' said Bonetta. "'A man, do you say?' cried Graziella. "'Let us hurry down to the door and see him nearer.' When they stood in the doorway, the merman stopped to look at the princess and made many signs of admiration. His voice was very hoarse and husky, but when he found that he was not understood, he took to signs. He carried a little basket made of osiers and filled with rare shells, which he presented to the princess. She took it with signs of thanks, but as it was getting dusk, she retired, and the merman plunged back into the sea. When they were alone, Graziella said to her governess, What a dreadful-looking creature that was! 
Why do those odious sharks let him come near the tower? I suppose all men are not like him. No, indeed, replied Bonetta. I suppose the sharks look on him as a sort of relation, and so did not attack him. A few days later, the two ladies heard a strange sort of music, and looking out of the window, there was the merman, his head crowned with water plants, and blowing a great seashell with all his might. They went down to the tower door, and Graziella politely accepted some coral and other marine curiosities he had brought her. After this, he used to come every evening and blow his shell, or dive and play antics under the princess's window. She contented herself with bowing to him from the balcony, but she would not go down to the door in spite of all his signs. Some days later, he came with a person of his own kind, but of another sex. Her hair was dressed with great taste, and she had a lovely voice. This new arrival induced the ladies to go down to the door. They were surprised to find that, after trying various languages, she at last spoke to them in their own, and paid Graziella a very pretty compliment on her beauty. The mermaid noticed that the lower floor was full of water. Why, cried she, that is just the place for us, for we can't live quite out of water. So saying, she and her brother swam in and took up a position in the bathroom, the princess and her governess seating themselves on the steps which ran round the room. No doubt, madam, said the mermaid, you have given up living on land so as to escape from crowds of lovers, but I fear that even here you cannot avoid them, for my brother is already dying of love for you, and I am sure that once you are seen in our city he will have many rivals. She then went on to explain how grieved her brother was not to be able to make himself understood, adding, I interpret for him having been taught several languages by a fairy. Oh, then you have fairies too, asked Graziella with a sigh. Yes, we have, replied the mermaid, but if I am not mistaken, you have suffered from the fairies on earth. The princess, on this, told her entire history to the mermaid, who assured her how sorry she felt for her but begged her not to lose courage, adding, as she took her leave, perhaps some day you may find a way out of your difficulties. The princess was delighted with this visit, and with the hopes the mermaid held out, it was something to meet someone fresh to talk to. We will make acquaintance with several of these people, she said to her governess, and I dare say they are not as hideous as the first one we saw. Anyhow, we shan't be so dreadfully lonely. Dear me, said Bonetta, how hopeful young people are, to be sure. As for me, I feel afraid of these folk, but what do you think of the lover you have captivated? Oh, I could never love him, cried the princess. I can't bear him. But perhaps, as his sister says, they are related to the fairy Marina. They may be of some use to us. The mermaid often returned, and each time she talked of her brother's love, and each time Graziella talked of her longing to escape from her prison, till at length the mermaid promised to bring the fairy Marina to see her, in hopes she might suggest something. Next day the fairy came with the mermaid and the princess received her with delight. After a little talk, she begged Graziella to show her the inside of the tower, and let her see the garden on the top. For with the help of crutches, she could manage to move about, and being a fairy could live out of water for a long time, provided she wetted her forehead now and then. Graziella gladly consented, and Bonetta stayed below with the mermaid. When they were in the garden, the fairy said, Let us lose no time, but tell me how I can be of use to you. Graziella then told all her story, and Marina replied, My dear princess, I can do nothing for you, as regards dry land, for my power does not reach beyond my own element. I can only say that if you will honor my cousin by accepting his hand, 
you could then come and live amongst us i could teach you in a moment to swim and dive with the best of us i can harden your skin without spoiling its color my cousin is one of the best matches in the sea and i will bestow so many gifts on him that you will be quite happy the fairy talked so well and so long that the princess was rather impressed and promised to think the matter over just as they were going to leave the garden they saw a ship sailing near the tower than any other had done before on the deck lay a young man under a splendid awning gazing at the tower through a spy-glass but before they could see anything clearly the ship moved away and the two ladies parted the fairy promising to return shortly as soon as she was gone graziella told her governess what she had said bonetta was not at all pleased at the turn matters were taking for she did not fancy being turned into a mermaid in her old age she thought the matter well over and this was what she did she was a very clever artist and next morning she began to paint a picture of a handsome young man with beautiful curly hair a fine complexion and lovely blue eyes when it was finished she showed it to graziella hoping it would show her the difference there was between a fine young man and her marine suitor the princess was much struck by the picture and asked anxiously whether there could be any man so good-looking in the world bonetta assured her that there were plenty of them indeed many far handsomer i can hardly believe that cried the princess but alas if there are i don't suppose i shall ever see them or they me so what is the use oh dear how unhappy i am she spent the rest of the day gazing at the picture which certainly had the effect of spoiling all the merman's hopes or prospects after some days the fairy marina came back to hear what was decided but graziella hardly paid any attention to her and showed such dislike to the idea of the proposed marriage that the fairy went off in a regular huff without knowing it the princess had made another conquest on board the ship which had sailed so near was the handsomest prince in the world he had heard of the enchanted tower and determined to get as near it as he could he had strong glasses on board and whilst looking through them he saw the princess quite clearly and fell desperately in love with her at once he wanted to steer straight for the tower and to row off to it in a small boat but his entire crew fell at his feet and begged him not to run such a risk the captain too urged him not to attempt it you will only lead us all to certain death he said pray anchor nearer land and i will then seek a kind fairy i know who has always been most obliging to me and who will i am sure try to help your highness the prince rather unwillingly listened to reason he landed at the nearest point and sent off the captain in all haste to beg the fairy's advice and help meantime he had a tent pitched on the shore and spent all his time gazing at the tower and looking for the princess through his spy-glass after a few days the captain came back bringing the fairy with him the prince was delighted to see her and paid her great attention i have heard about this matter she said and to lose no time i am going to send off a trusty pigeon to test the enchantment if there is any weak spot he is sure to find it out and get in i shall bid him bring a flower back as a sign of success and if he does so i quite hope to get you in too but asked the prince could i not send a line by the pigeon to tell the princess of my love certainly replied the fairy it would be a very good plan so the prince wrote as follows lovely princess i adore you and beg you to accept my heart and to believe there is nothing i will not do to end your misfortunes blundell this note was tied round the pigeon's neck and he flew off with it at once he flew fast till he got near the tower when a fierce wind blew so hard against him that he could not get on but 
he was not to be beaten, but flew carefully around the top of the tower till he came to one spot which, by some mistake, had not been enchanted like the rest. He quickly slipped into the arbor and waited for the princess. Before long Graziella appeared alone, and the pigeon at once fluttered to meet her, and seemed so tame that she stopped to caress the pretty creature. As she did so, she saw it had a pink ribbon round its neck, and tied to the ribbon was a letter. She read it over several times, and then wrote this answer. You say you love me, but I cannot promise to love you without seeing you. Send me your portrait by this faithful messenger. If I return it to you, you must give up hope. But if I keep it, you will know that to help me will be to help yourself. Graziella. Before flying back, the pigeon remembered about the flower. So, seeing one in the princess's dress, he stole it and flew away. The prince was wild with joy at the pigeon's return with the note. After an hour's rest, the trusty little bird was sent back again, carrying a miniature of the prince, which by good luck he had with him. On reaching the tower, the pigeon found the princess in the garden. She hastened to untie the ribbon, and, on opening the miniature case, what was her surprise and delight to find it very like the picture her governess had painted for her. She hastened to send the pigeon back, and you can fancy the prince's joy when he found she had kept his portrait. Now, said the fairy, let us lose no more time. I can only make you happy by changing you into a bird, but I will take care to give you back your proper shape at the right time. The prince was eager to start, so the fairy, touching him with her wand, turned him into the loveliest hummingbird you ever saw, at the same time letting him keep the power of speech. The pigeon was told to show him the way. Graziella was much surprised to see a perfectly strange bird, and still more so when it flew to her, saying, Good morning, sweet princess. She was delighted with the pretty creature, and let him perch on her finger, when he said, Kiss, kiss, little birdie, which she gladly did, petting and stroking him all the time. After a time, the princess, who had been up very early, grew tired, and, as the sun was hot, she went to lie down on a mossy bank in the shade of the arbor. She held the pretty bird near her breast, and was just falling asleep, when the fairy contrived to restore the prince to his own shape, so that, as Graziella opened her eyes, she found herself in the arms of a lover, whom she loved in return. At the same moment, her enchantment came to an end. The tower began to rock and to split. Bonetta hurried up to the top so that she might at least perish with her dear princess. Just as she reached the garden, the kind fairy who had helped the prince arrived with the fairy Placida in a car of Venetian glass drawn by six eagles. "'Come away quickly!' they cried. "'The tower is about to sink!' The prince, princess, and Bonetta lost no time in stepping into the car, which rose in the air just as, with a terrible crash, the tower sank into the depths of the sea, for the fairy Marina and the mermen had destroyed its foundations to avenge themselves on Graziella. Luckily, their wicked plans were defeated, and the good fairies took their way to the kingdom of Graziella's parents. They found that Queen Mutinosa had died some years ago, but her kind husband lived on peaceably, ruling his country well and happily. He received his daughter with great delight, and there were universal rejoicings at the return of the lovely princess. The wedding took place the very next day, and for many days after, balls, dinners, tournaments, concerts, and all sorts of amusements went on all day and all night. All the fairies were carefully invited, and they came in great state, and promised the young couple their protection and all sorts of good gifts. Prince Blondel and Princess Graziella lived to a good old age, beloved by everyone, and loving each other more and more as time went on. <laughs>